All these promises, all these blessings that God has for his family in particular, not just the world, he cares about the world, but his family are now not only available to you, they are abundantly provided for you. And then you also have the heavenly kingdom. And then he talks, well, actually previous to that, he talks about why is it then that if I am in the family of God, how come when I want to do right, I do wrong? How come when I'm trying really hard, I still struggle? What is up with that? And he says it's because of the mind. It's because we have to be changed. God gives you a new heart when you come to him. Your mind has to be washed and changed. And when your thinking changes, your actions change. That's how it works. I have to think differently about something in order to act differently about something. As if I hold my old thinking about something and try to act differently, the best I can do is short term. Because I really believe this. Whatever you believe most, you will walk out. If I believe I can't, and no matter how many people tell me I can, if I really believe it's not for me, I can't do this, I can't. Guess what? You're not going to do it. So, he gets into chapter 12, and now he begins to talk about what does it look like when you're a child of God? How does that begin to change you, and how do you live in the environment of the nation of the world you are a part of. And so in Romans 12, 2, kind of sums up the beginning of this process. He says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. Everybody in here has been shaped by the behavior and customs of the world you lived in. Not the world, your world your family, your, your, or, your place of origin, the schools, the traumatic things that have happened, all the different aspects of life that have given you a view of how the world operates. He says, now that you are in Christ, don't conform. Don't be like that anymore. Don't copy it anymore. So in order to not copy it anymore, because you live that way, because you thought about life that way, like they did that little skit. If you think people can't be trusted, if you think people are, are you know, out to get you all the time, how are you going to act towards people? Well, they can't be trusted and they're out to get me all the time. So you're going to be very defensive. You're going to be looking for that. How many have been in a relationship and you got wounded in a relationship? Pity the poor person that comes into your life next. Pity that next person because they are going to wear the jacket of that one. And it's going to be a while before they take it off and see you as you. And in fact, if they don't deal with their stuff, if they don't deal with the forming of how they view and what they've experienced, that they will always treat that person differently than what that person even deserves. So he says this, but let God, don't be conformed, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And so to think God thoughts, to become godly, I have to know what God thinks. And that's why we need the Word. That's why we need the Holy Spirit to teach us. That's why we need other, you know, God's kids in our lives to help us navigate this world, not riding the same old boat we used to. So he says this. Then you will learn to know God's will for you. Learn is a process. You will learn. It's progressive. It, you, what you know now about God, partial. You will learn as you continue to walk this life and continue to choose God's way of dealing with stuff you will learn the ways of God. And you will see God move because when our ways line up with God's will and what He wants, we are in harmony with God. Then God takes the forefront. When I am, this is God's will, for an example, and I am running my own life the way I think it ought to be run, God goes, go, go. 
He's going to put up walls and, and you're going to run into stuff. But he says, go. But when you say, God, I want to do it your way, God says, okay, now I can show you. And then you begin to see how God operates because you and I are limited. So he says this. So then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. Then you will begin to understand, oh, God's will is good. How many of us in here didn't believe God's will for us was good? I remember being younger and thinking of Christians, it was like, that is the jokiest way to go. Ever. I will never follow that. I can't even imagine going through life like this all the time. And they have no fun, absolutely no fun. And, you know, I, I couldn't wrap my head around what that could even look like. Then now that I've been a Christian for quite a while, it's like, man, life is busy. Life's an adventure. It's not drudgery. It's an adventure. I mean, I don't like parts of it. Some of the rides are not that good. And, uh, but it's, a, it's an adventure, and we get to learn a new way of doing life, and life is full. Life becomes full. So he says, listen, this is what? You need to understand. Your mind has to be transformed. Then he jumps into chapter 13. And he goes, you need to handle the government differently than what you do. And now he's going to talk about the government. The country you live in. As a child of God and a member of the kingdom of God, I belong to a kingdom that is here but not yet here. It is building in me. The kingdom of God, Jesus told the people, starts here. He builds the kingdom in us, and then ultimately he will bring his kingdom that we will see, we will experience here. But he is establishing his kingdom in each one of us, transforming the way the world has taught us, our world, into the way he runs his kingdom. And as you, if you are a child of God, how that kingdom operates. Then he says, okay, now that you understand that, what about the, the kingdom you live in down here? How are we to respond to that? And he says this in Romans 13, 1. Everyone must submit to the governing authorities. For all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and they will be punished. How many just thought that was stupid right there? <laughs> That's crazy talk. That is crazy talk. And especially for people, many of us, who are rebels by nature. We don't like authority, period. In fact, I've never met a person in recovery of any kind that embraces... Well, I've never met a person anywhere, any, now that I think about it, who has ever said, authority, you know what? I'm just that guy. I follow it. Tell me what to do, and I'm all in. We're that person. We're, we're people that go, authority, nah. And a lot of that is formed in our childhood of how we view authority growing up. We have all that different experience. The main two authority figures in your life when you're young are mom and dad. The next group of authority figures are brothers and sisters, especially if you're younger. How does that work? Now, your experience with mom and dad or lack of that experience paints a picture of how you look at older people, how you look at authority. You show me your friends. If all your friends are your age, in your age bracket, I, I, I can tell you right off the bat, you got authority issues. You don't have any older people in your life that speak into your life? Hmm, that's a problem. You know, how many know that now that that's a problem? How many are still on the fence? <laughs> so, yeah. How old? Like six months? <laughs> it's like, hey, we need people. And, and the scripture tells us they need to be, we need to have more mature people in the Lord than us. Older women teach the younger women. Older men teach the younger men. Why? Because we need accountability. We need that. And that is God's reason for forming governments, is to keep things in check. Now, they don't always do that, but God says, you need to understand this. And if you do understand that, read those verses, and it begins to wash 
your mind and how you look at things, you begin to see that all authority, according to God, is under God. And he has placed it there, and he's got a reason for it. And there's multiple reasons for it. Now, what we tend to do oftentimes is I will respect authority. I will respect leadership. I will respect position based on who that person is. Anybody ever done that before? I, I don't honor the position. I honor the person or dishonor the person. If, you're, if you are not like I think you ought to be, then I have full right to go against that because they're not right. Well, you know what? Scripture doesn't say that. Scripture says you are to honor those God places above you, all authority. Not because they're necessarily worthy of it, but because God. So the only reason I will submit to authority is because God says to submit to it, so I'm submitting to God. If I don't, and I'm choosing who I submit to and who I don't, what I'm really saying is, I'm God. I'll submit to you if you act according to the way I think you ought to act. If you don't, <laughs> I get to do what I want. I'll submit to my employee. Anybody ever think that in their job? That guy shouldn't be in that position. Who's he think he is? I wonder how many people he's sucked up to. Oh my gosh, he doesn't know anything. Oh, they don't pay me enough here. I'm a, you know, hey, I can take some stuff because they don't treat me right. They don't know who I am. Yeah, I know who you are. You're the guy that does the mail. Do your job. If you don't like it, there's other jobs. How many of you ever had that? Well, I don't have the skills. Get skills. How many have talked ourselves out of stuff? You know, we limit ourselves the most. Maybe God's trying to stir you into something more, but you keep pushing it away, and yet you'll complain incessantly. Not you guys, maybe the nine o'clockers, but <laughs> incessantly about the situation. It's like, you know what? We live in America. Of all the countries in the world, you got the top. We get to do what we want to do in so many ways. You know, we get... We, I mean, if anything ever happens, hey, here's something you need to know. If anything ever happens, come to the church. I got a key to Moe's bag. We will eat, and we got many people that can sleep on pews. So we got our own little sanctuary city. <laughs> a couple of you are taking notes. Hmm. Well, some, somebody there is taking notes. How do I get a key? Find out who is the key keeper. Anyway, let's go on. He says this. We need to get that kind of mindset. Now, you need to understand, Paul is writing this letter to Romans. The Roman government for, I don't know, a couple hundred years at this point in time were bent on expanding the kingdom, the Roman Empire. And one of the things they would do as they expanded the Roman Empire is that they would, besides conquer the land, they would conquer the people. Oftentimes they'd kill most of the men, but they take some of them as slaves. They take the women and children, a large portion of them as slaves, and they would bring them back to Rome and sell them, and they would become slaves. So there were people, and the pop, there were people that had a real bad attitude about the Roman government. Not only did that, half the population were slaves. Women had pretty much zero rights. Children had less than that. If you were a Roman citizen, you had all the protections of the legal system in place by the Romans. If you weren't, you had very little protection. So there was all this mixed group of people coming into the church with all their attitudes about the government. You had those that loved it because it worked for them. You had those that had tremendous hate in them because of what the Romans did to their own land and to their own people and to their husbands and their brothers and the rape and all the other stuff that took place. There was 
there was a lot of stuff going on. So Paul is talking to these people about, and, and the beautiful thing about the church back then is they were taken, like it is now, taken in all kinds of people. But not only that, you had the Jews. You had the Jews who had come into the church who believed you do not support secular government. Their monies were supposed to go to the synagogue and to the priesthood and, and all that stuff. And they were to be their, the, their own theocracy. And in that group of Jews, you had a group called the Zealots, who in our day and age would be terrorists. They terrorized the Roman government because they were one of the lands. The, the land of Israel, the Palestine area, was under the control of the Romans. And the, Romans, uh, the, the Jews were notorious as being one of the most rebellious groups of people. That's why Herod, and you read the story of Jesus, Herod and Pontius Pilate and stuff, they, their ideas, when they, if there was a smell of rebellion, it was usually the Jews and crush them. So the zealots were the terrorists. They would ambush little groups of Romans. They would catch things on fire. They would do what they could to undermine everything the Roman government did. Jesus, one of his disciples, was called, one of the apostles actually, was called Simon the Zealot. This guy belonged to that group of people. So imagine the transformation that had to take place in his mind. Imagine these Jews now in the church reading this letter and seeing that we need to treat the government right. And, if, you know, this was a, a huge deal. In fact, the zealots would oftentimes, if they saw fellow Jews paying tribute, there's two things that we'll, Paul will mention here. He'll mention taxes and tribute. In our world, that would be fees. If you want to build onto your house, you got to pay a fee. And then, so all the fees entitled, besides taxes, they would rebel against pain. Everything they did was trying to undermine the government. And if you were a Jew and they saw you paying taxes, if they saw you paying the fees, well, they would do a number of things. One, the, the least thing they would do to you is burn your house down, burn your farm down. The worst thing they would do to you is assassinate you. And these were their brother and sisters, Jews. These guys were terrorists for the Jewish nation. They wanted to restore their nation. So Paul is writing to this hodgepodge group of people that have come into the kingdom with all kinds of different backgrounds. And he's telling them now, now that you're a member of the kingdom of God, you need to respond to the lower kingdom that's operating in the earth that you are under in a way that's right and honors God. Because you have to believe and trust that the God who runs everything is also running the government. Because when you and I get to start choosing and picking what God runs and what he doesn't, then we're all in trouble. Does that make sense to you guys? He's either in charge of it all or he's not in charge. He's not a God that's in charge of some of it. And the rest of it, I don't know, it's a toss-up. Hopefully the people do well. So Paul is writing to these guys and he's telling them you need to submit to the authorities because God ordained government as a way, one of the things that he'll say here, as a way to keep people in check. Now we know people can abuse that position. But the bottom line is, is our initial obligation is to do right by the laws of the land. So he goes, and, and, and you may think, wow, this is an isolated incident. No, all, it's a theme through the New Testament. In fact, in 1 Timothy 2, uh, chapter 2, verse 1, Paul's writing to this young pastor in a church in Ephesus, which was another crazy place. He's, he, he writes this, I urge you, speaking to Timothy, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them. Your congregation, pray for the people in your congregation, Tim. Intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Pray this for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. He says, you need to be godly. So here's what you and I need to do. What does that translate into? You need to pray for our leaders. Pray they be saved. 
Pray they be saved. If you're a complainer, if you're, you know, if you get all your news from CNN or Fox or anywhere in between there, um, you need to pray for the leaders that God will touch them. Why? Because their minds will not begin to be transformed into godly ways of doing life until they meet God. And so that's the prayer. He says, why? So we can live a peaceful life. And that you can walk in dignity. You can hold your head up and say, I, no matter what's going on here, I keep my eyes on the kingdom up there and I do what's right. You and I don't get the option to do certain slices of the pie right and other slices of the pie any which way we think. Our job is to be holistic in how we approach every area of life. What would God have me do in this slice? What would God have me do in that slice? So Paul writing to these guys says, hey, I see a big issue with the way you guys live. You need to do right by the government. And this is the crazy part. Ten years from when this letter was written, or ten years about, Nero came into power who was the worst Caesar of all the Caesars and initiated the deep persecution of Christians for the next 200 years on and off in the Roman Empire until ultimately the collapse. So there was an, uh, a time of persecution, a time of relaxation of the persecution, a time of persecution, a time of relaxation of the persecution. And what's crazy is if you read the early church fathers, the, the, uh, you know, the people that followed the apostles, the next group of leaders that, and the men and women that were leading the, the church after this particular time, they wrote this similar things. Under the duress of Nero, they wrote, we need to honor the government. We need to pray and honor the government. We need to do what is right. And, but if, you know, there is a higher law, there is the God law. So if Nero or anybody else asks you to violate God's higher law, I have a responsibility to deal with the higher law. And in their case, that means if they were asked to renounce Christ and kiss the feet of Nero or kiss the portrait of uh, the, the, the sculptor of Nero to pronounce that they worship Nero, you can't do that at the cost of being dressed up in skins and fed to lions, at the cost of being crucified or hung upside down. That's the cost. Other than that, paying your taxes and stuff like that, pay them. You need to pay the fees and the stuff. So Paul mentions that. Not only did it's First Timothy, Titus 3.1. He says, remind the believers to submit to the government and its officers. They should be obedient, always ready to do what is good. First Peter, Peter writing, he says, for the Lord's sake, you, you obey because you're obeying God. Submit to all human authority. Now, remember, this is Peter. The guy that didn't cement to Jesus. Jesus to get a plan. Peter goes, nah, not a chance. That ain't going to happen. Because he's like us. That's why I love that guy. He, he was always willing to tell God what he needed to do. And like we do too. How many times do we inform God of what's really going on? The points he is missing. We're going to fill in the blank spots, Lord, so you can connect the dots and make the right decision, which of course is always my decision. So he says, listen, submit to all human authority, whether the king as head of state or the officials he has appointed, for the king has sent them to punish those who do wrong and to honor those who do right. As far as possible in my life, I am to do right by the government. And one of the reasons God places it in there is to stop evil. Now, Paul, if you know anything about his life, the Roman government saved him a couple times. The Jews were willing to kill him a number of times, and he pleaded his citizenship to Rome. And the Roman government came in and said, whoa, 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 you can't kill this dude. He's got due process. He's a citizen. One of the things that we have in our country as citizens is we have rights. We have rights. And that's been a big deal in our own, you know, in our own world, the whole idea of citizenship and what does that mean and all that. I'll tell you what citizenship means. It means you have rights. When you give rights to non-citizens in a, in a lot of rights, 
you, you subvert what citizenship means. So is that, that, that dynamic? And our country's wrestling with that dynamic right now. What do we do about all that? How does that work? What, uh, what, what, what's this happening? So there's, you know, and, and we think we're in our generation, so we're concerned with our generation. But the truth is, every generation deals with the government. I can just imagine, what were you thinking in Europe during World War II and World War I? When your country and your homes were leveled to the ground. I don't know if we have any immigrants here from there or, or second generation that have come over. But what does that look like? We've never had that kind of war here to go, except going back to the Civil War and the Revolutionary War. But that was way in you know, the corner. And the Civil War, I don't think anybody's here old enough to remember that. But what, what would it mean to have your land invaded and all that stuff take place? You know, there's... Love of country takes a whole nother step when you're dealing with loss. So we have to respect what God has put in place and we have to exercise our rights as God's kids to vote and to do those different things. You know, and we need to do that. And we need to be people who follow God in that arena. And I, let's personalize it. Listen. If all your buddies are hanging out and they're all gossiping and slandering people and stuff like that, I have an obligation not to join in on that. I have an obligation. Why? I have a higher law. I have a higher law that says believe what's right, believe what's good, believe what's true. And so I am obligated in my everyday life to walk out. How many of us have been super silent at work? We don't, you know, we, we hear all the scuttle, but we really don't say anything about Jesus because we don't want to draw that fire. And I get it. I get it. I don't like to go to parties or, or outside events and people walk up to me and go, hey, Pastor Joe, it's just like, oh, now, now the cover's blown. <laughs> now everybody around me changes. It's like, Pastor, it's like you may as well say I'm an insurance agent. <laughs> you know, I sell cars. It's like that, that same kind of thing. It's like, just call me Joe. That's where I got the name PJ, in case any of you ever hear that. It's like, you know, just call him PJ because it, it, it changes the dynamic. Now I'm looked at differently, and now I have to respond. Like, I'm not going to drink or anything, but I'll tell you what. You call somebody pastor, everybody watches what that guy's doing. <laughs> they look at how I'm looking, too. You know, I mean, they, they look where I'm looking. That, you know, I, I get under this microscope. Well, the problem is, if you're a Christian, you should be under that same one. You know, you're in the same boat. If the people at your work are going to be the most surprised that you're a Christian, that's a problem. They're going to be shocked that that's you. That's a problem. You know, that, and, but I get it because we don't want any persecution that might come with that. Any people looking down. And I'll tell you what, if you do say you're a Christian, how does everybody start looking at you? They start, you know, they have their own stereotypes. They start watching what you're doing. And what are you, what's going on with you? And, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. Are you, the, are you the real deal? I'll tell you what's awesome about being a pastor is if you come to this church and you've been wounded in another church, you give me the stink eye. And... Uh, because they, you know, they're, they're looking at me, what's, what's this guy all about now? What's this guy going to do? What's, this, what's, his, what's his deal? How many have given me the stink eye in here? How many still are? You haven't kind of... <laughs> still on trial. Some of us in relationships. You got wounded in a relationship, that poor next person is always on trial. All right, back to the government now that I got that out. <laughs> so Romans 13.3 gives us the reason what Paul's talking about. He says, For the authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing right, but in those who are doing wrong. Would you like to live without fear of the authorities? Do what is right, and they will honor you. I mean, generally speaking, that, that's the way it ought to be. It's not always that way. But I'll tell you what. When I've done wrong, I feared the authorities. Have you ever noticed, I'll tell you, this is a true story. I don't know about you guys, but when I was doing my thing, 
Getting my car registered was not my gig. It was not my gig. Changing the oil was a stretch for me. And, uh, but I did you know, I didn't, and, and it seemed like, you ever notice that you get pulled over all the time when you're doing wrong? It's like a, anybody else, come on. It's like a vibe you send off or something. It's like, you know, but when I got sober, I still didn't have money to get my car registered. I didn't have money to do that for like a year. And, uh, yeah, I'm driving around with little kids in the car and Teresa in the car. And it's, it's like, you know, and I'm praying. But this, this is the difference. I'm praying, oh, God, blind them. Oh, God, blind them. Give me, you know, <laughs> give, me, give me mercy. And I wasn't making promises to them like I did when I was using. Oh, God, if you get me out of this, I'll never use till like the weekend. But, you know, I, 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 I was making, and I just asked God. And I can't tell you how many times a policeman pulled right behind me. And I knew that, uh, you know, the car's getting impounded. And, you know, and, and, you know, the kids got to, Teresa's got to carry three kids. And, uh, <laughs> and I never got pulled over. I never got pulled over until I could afford to pay the registration. And God does all those little kinds of miracles when you be, you know, start to line up with him. When I really, you know, I, I say, God, I need to get this registered. I get it. I need to be this guy. I need to be the guy. I need to be legit. And that's the deal. I need to be legit across the board. I can't be legit up and down and all around based on how I feel I need to be legit. You know, I can't be a good employee and steal their time. They're paying me for this. I can't complain about this. Those are my authority figures. They're, they're the people. I need to respect them. And the only way out of that, well, let's, let me finish reading this and I'll, I'll go to that. He says, the authorities are God's servants. God looks at the authorities as his servants, so he's going to manipulate them as he will. And that's why I always got popped. He manipulated them. The guy wouldn't even be looking my way, and God just turns his head. <laughs> I, exactly. <laughs> and so, sent for your good. But if you are doing wrong, of course you should be afraid, for they have the power to punish you. They are God's servants sent for the very purpose of punishing those who do what is wrong. So it is God's method to keep people in check. I've oftentimes told people when they got pulled over and taken to jail and had to do some time, it's like, you know what? God might have sent that black and white for you. That might be your way of salvation. That might be the thing you need. You know, it isn't about your luck or why this guy didn't or they didn't and why it's always happening to me and all that kind of stuff. It's always happening to you because you're not playing right. Why do I have problems with relationships? Because you don't play well with others. That's your problem. It ain't the others. You're the common denominator here. What is it about you? When we start to look at that, then God starts to step in and teach us. Your, your thinking is wrong. So he goes, so you must submit to them, not only to avoid punishment, but also to keep a clear conscience. So he gives us two reasons why God sets up authority over us. One, to keep us in check, and two, that we may have a clear conscience. How many of us have had work done by Christians that turned out to be subpar? But they threw the Christian name around as, a, you know, as their card. I'm a Christian, brother. I'll tell you what, nowadays when you tell me a Christian, it's like, can I see photos of your work? <laughs> then we can pray together. Yay! Well, let me see what you do. And do you do it on time? Because I've heard too many stories of Christians working other Christians and not being men or women of their word to other brothers and sisters. It does great damage. So he says, listen, whatever you are, you need to walk with clear conscience. I, you know, it, it's, a, it's a big deal. So, then he's going to hit us where it really hurts. He goes, verse 6, pay your taxes too. It's like, ugh, you would have to go there, wouldn't you? Because listen, you owe taxes. We have a government that needs taxes to support what it does. 
And I tell you what, I take every loophole I can. I take every legal exemption I can get, everything that does. But I'll tell you what I don't do is I don't cheat. I'm, I don't cheat the, because why? I have to have a clear conscience. And that clear conscience is with God. I go to God and he goes, Joe, what about your taxes? How about that loving my neighbor thing, Lord? Let's focus on that for a little while. <laughs> Joe, what about your taxes? What about that? It's like, I need to be right in that area. And then he goes on to say this, for government workers need to be paid. They are serving God in what they do. He says the government, the policemen, the firemen, the, the, all that stuff, all the roads, all the everything else we have in this country needs the taxes of people. I have an obligation to be part of that. Even though I belong to this kingdom up here, I live under this world right here. I have an obligation to that. It is a big deal. And, you know, and that's one of the complaints we have in our country is, is that why are we giving all this stuff to people that don't do anything to support what is going on? And I'm all for charity. I'm all for all that stuff. But it is a legit question and it is a legit issue we have to deal with as a, as, as a people. But this is the thing. I can only deal with me. I need to be productive for the kingdom of God. Because if I work and I do these things, I can also give. I can also be that person that helps the church of God touch lives. We're all in this together. He says, now this is the interesting thing. If you're, a, if you're, I love what Teddy Roosevelt once said. He said, hey, if you become a millionaire in, in, in government, you're corrupt. <laughs> Do you know in our country, you can serve one term in Congress or Senate, one term, one four-year term, couple times in six year terms and for the rest of your life receive 180,000 a year we we have in our government right now 382 of our congressmen and women that are millionaires the vast majority did not enter government that way we have some of the higher leadership worth hundreds of millions of dollars and all they've done their whole life is be in government it's impossible to do that. Something is going on here. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about you need, they need to get paid just like every other job needs to. You're doing a job, you should be paid for it. But it's to take care of stuff. It's not to make them millionaires at the cost of whatever or billionaires in the cost of whatever. So we need to you know, understand that you and I have an obligation. Now, we can trip out on all this stuff. And this is the thing. You don't need to. But what if the government is doing things that are not right and are causing people to have to do that which goes, goes against God? Well, in the book of Acts, because that's the normal question. Joe, that's great you're telling us about this government and how wonderful it is. But what if it's corrupt? And let me tell you this. Every government is corrupt. Every government is corrupt. Why? Power corrupts. The more power you give people, the more opportunity they have for corruption. And you and I, no matter who we are, at some level are prone to corruption. You have to be diligent in your walk with God to avoid corruption. You have to intentionally keep yourself accountable. And I know from the pastoral world, pastors fall because they don't keep themselves accountable. They don't keep themselves in check. If you have nobody outside you keeping you in check, guess what? You're not in check. How many know that in their own lives? Who takes care of Joe? Joe does. How's he doing? Horrible. He lets Joe get away with everything. He even helps Joe write his rationalizations and justifications for doing wrong. You need somebody in your life to speak some truth to you and tell you. How many of us have been, like, I remember when I got ordained back in 89 at this church, and, and uh, I remember the pastor's wife talking to Teresa and I. Mainly, she was talking to us, but she was looking at me and speaking to me. And so she said, hey, listen. 
You need to listen to your wife. She, is, she will give you the best advice you will ever get. You need to honor and respect that. She's your helpmate. You need to, I felt like, I started sweating. Like my, you know, and then my mind goes, to, what about? And so, so, but it was, you know, and I've, I've always taken that to heart. I might disagree with her, and, and we have had our disagreements, but I listen to her. I, I want her input. I appreciate her set of eyes. I appreciate her mind. I appreciate that God has brought her to me, and, and I'm a fool not to take advantage of it. And, and I'll tell you what, the, one of the worst things that can happen in a marriage is when you don't value each other. When you lose that honor and respect that God has brought this person, you're going to have issues, but you've got to navigate through them. Um, so, but in Acts 4.20, um, the, the apostles had been arrested. The Jews had provoked their arrest. They were brought before the Romans, and the Romans found out that what's going on here, the legal system. And so it says in verse 18, so they called the apostles back in and commanded them never again to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. They told them to never do what God ordained them to do again. And that's when we have the approval of God to go against government. If government were to come into my home and say, you can never pray again. You can never do anything with the Lord again. Don't ever mention his name again. I'd have, to, I'd have to disobey that. But there can be a price to that. There can be a great price to it. But this is what their response was to that. But Peter and John replied, Do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? I am to honor the government in what the government has authority over. And that's the running of either a city, a county, a, a state, a country. I honor that because God said to honor that. But if they move beyond their stated cause for being and start to dictate to me or to a God's kids how we are to respond, if that is against what I know God's will is, I can't obey that. I cannot obey that. But I also have to understand that I may pay a price for that like they do in China and many other places in the world. I understand that in the time of Nero, they wrapped them up in, in, in soaked rope and, and used them as torches. I understand that there's a price to that. My, my heart is a desire to follow the Lord no matter what. My ability to do that is I will need the grace of God at the time when that comes. I mean, if someone were to hold a gun to my kids and say, I will kill them if, unless you deny the Lord, I don't judge anybody. That's a tough place to be, and that does take place. Don't fool yourselves. We live in a country where it doesn't, but it could. So we have an obligation to follow God when His law is higher than the government's law. So... In Acts uh, 5.29, same thing happened. Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human authority. So that is our out of that. Outside of that, I have a responsibility to obey those that God puts over me. So back to Romans. Romans 13.8. Then he says this. He says, owe nothing to anyone. The word owe is in the positive sense. It's not in the negative sense of, you know, never get in debt. What it, the sense of that word is, is if you owe somebody, whether it's the government, whether it's, you know, your job, whether it's whatever you owe, pay it. Pay it so that you have character and you are a man or woman that who does what they say they do because that honors God. Because I'm a member of that kingdom and we walk in honesty. And, we, and if I say I'm in debt, then I deal with that. Then he says this, there's only one debt that you will never be, uh, ex, you know, without obligation, except for your obligation to love one another. If you love your neighbor, you will fulfill the requirements of God's law. For the commandments say you must not commit adultery, you must not murder, you must not steal. Those are the high laws. You must not covet. These and other such commandments are summed up in this one commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. And this is how you know you're loving your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to others. 
We don't do that which harms others. Uh, some of us do, and we call it love, but it's really enabling. If you're making bad decisions, and I help you make bad decisions, I am not helping you. I am causing harm to you. I am helping you stay in that bad place. So I have an obligation. If I'm not going to do harm to you, I step away. You continue to make bad decisions, that's on you. But I'm not going to help you. I am not going to participate in that. And so I don't do another song. I don't commit adultery. Why? Because I don't harm that person and their spouse or their friend. I don't, we don't get that option. We don't get to do things that harm others. That's what loving your neighbor means. I do no harm. So I have to look at it and say, what is this about? Am I harming the situation or am I helping the situation? It's, yeah, my thinking has to be transformed to what is the best thing to do here. And then this, how do I walk it out? There's also timing issues involved. How does that happen? What do we do here? So he says, listen, that is the law of God. So love fulfills the requirements of God's law. Now, this next little section is where we'll close up. He, he says, this is why I'm telling you all this. He says, listen, this is all the more urgent for you know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is almost done. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living. He says, listen, the reason I'm telling you all this, this was 57-ish about A.D. So we're almost 2,000 years past that. He says, the reason I'm telling you this is the kingdom up there is coming. The kingdom up there is coming. And we need to live in such a manner that we understand that all this is passing. It's going to come, it's going to go, it's going to ebb, it's going to flow. It's going to move. You need to keep your eyes on because the Lord can come at any time. And you need and I need to be about my Father's business. When the Lord comes, I need to be about what God has placed in my hands doing. And that's what I need to be about. All this other stuff, oh, I need to pray. I need to vote. I might need to do something. But my goal is to be about the kingdom because all this is fading away. The people in office now won't be a people in office 10 years from now. And that's the other thing you learn as you get older. They come and go. They come and go. And yet, I still need food on the table. I still got to work. I still got to do the things I do. I still got to minister. God's called me to minister to a demographic of people. That's what I need to be. When he comes, I need to be about that business till I retire. And that's my last subject I want to talk about. No. <laughs> ah. Listen, he says then, so put on the armor of right living. Take off your dirty clothes, which go with your old thinking. Take off that. You've been given a righteous robe in Christ. Now learn to walk that way so that when he comes, he finds you about his business. It's a good thing. Yeah, but his business is hard. You know, yeah, yeah, so what? What isn't hard? God, kill that word, it's hard. How many have used that for an excuse in their life? I, I want to do that, but it's so hard. So if it was easy, you'd do it. How many things do you do that's easy? I don't know of one thing I do that's easy. I have seasons, which are normally days of easy. But generally speaking, it's an uphill trudge. It's an uphill trudge with a little place to put your tent every now and then. And then you got to pack it up and go again. That's life. That's the way it is. Then you get older. Teresa and I were just sitting here a minute ago in church, during worship going like this with our skin so thin so thin and it is am i hydrated 
I can see every vein. I used to not see any veins. Now I see them all. I can take a pulse anywhere on my hand. <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> I laugh because I would be crying if I didn't. But bottom line is this. Lord's coming back. Be about his business. Can we stand up? We submit to the authorities because we submit to God because his kingdom is coming. And I need to pray, let your will be done. You know, and even Jesus, one, I don't, you know, you guys might have heard the coin story with Jesus, but the Jewish zealot, the rabbis, the Pharisees one time said to Jesus, they were trying to trap him and get him in trouble with the Roman government because they didn't want to pay taxes. So they were going to see what this rabbi Jesus said. And they said, hey, Jesus, do you pay taxes? Because they're trying to catch him so that if he said no, they can run to the Romans and try to get him. And Jesus knew their motives. And he looked at him and he says, give me a coin. And he got the coin. And he says, whose image is on this? And they said, Caesar's. He goes, well, render to Caesar. Then what is Caesar's? Render to God. What is God's? Pay your taxes, he still basically told them. And they went, I hate that guy. He's so smart. <laughs> this is the thing, gang. You can't fool God. You can't. You know, he said, do what he says. Just do what he says. So let's go. Let, let, can I lead you in a prayer? Lord Jesus, I repent of tripping out so much on the stuff around me. Whether it be God, I mean, the, well, you. Whether it be you. Whether it be our government. Whether it be my mind. Whether it be my employer. My employees. My relationships, basically the whole deal. Help me, God, to deal with every slice of the pie of my life. Well, I thank you that you've given me a robe of righteousness. Teach me how to walk it out in every area of my life. And I submit to that. And I really do. I really, really do. I mean it. I'm not kidding. Oh, amen. All right, God bless you guys. Have a good day.